We have a different offering taker this morning. If she looks a little confused, just give her a little guidance and help her along her way. Tell her she's doing a good job. I don't know about it. And Brother Leon, that's exactly what you're going to take up the offering every single time. We'll shake them down every time. Yeah. Okay, but we're going back to our study on what does it mean to be a Pentecostal pastor. And I know we say it every week, but repetition is a good thing. The way we're looking at this is through the eyes of somebody who goes to the gym all the time, or do the comparison of that. And when they go to the gym to get lean, mean, buff, and tough, they don't go just once a day. Oh, they do go sometimes once a day, sometimes twice a day. But it's not like they go one day a week, and that's it. Or one day a month, and that's it. And it's not like when they go on the diet, they do like some of us do, and we do the seafood diet, where we eat everything we see. But rather, they go, they have a goal, they have effort, they have willpower, and they know what they're going to do. This day, they might be leg, or focusing on working out the legs. This day, they might be focusing on the arms. But they keep doing it every single day. Consistency is not a once and done thing. If we're going to become mighty in the things of God, it's going to be when we get serious with God and we read the Bible every single day, we pray every single day, and every day when we do these things, we do it with the intent that we're going to know God. It's the same mindset that the Apostle Paul had when he wrote, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. I told the kids in the youth night just this past Friday, Normally when you come to church and people start asking questions, what can we do to get close to God? All of a sudden we throw out the generic answer. Read the Bible, pray, fast. Are they the wrong answers? No, they're the right answers. But the correct thing is we need to make sure that our heart is in the right place. That we are doing it with the sincere intent that we may know Him and the power of His resurrection. Otherwise, fasting without praying or reading our Bible, it's just a diet. It doesn't really mean anything. When these things really take effect, when our relationship with God really begins to grow, is when we do them with an intent that we may know Him like never before. And that's exactly what we're talking about with becoming a Pentecostal powerhouse. It's not just a matter of reading our Bible every day, but reading it every day with the intent that I may know God. When we re reach our uh, knees in prayer, we are praying with the intent that I may know God. It's not just a God, this is what's going on in my life today. I need you to move and get up and go. But it's a communication where we are presenting our prayer request. We are praising God, but we're also keeping our spiritual ears open to listen to what God has to say. We are talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And there are how many gifts of the Spirit? Nine. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. Last week, we talked about gifts of healing, and we're going to continue that for a little bit here. Not the gifts, the working of miracles. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I got my new notes, and Gibson forgot to change the header at the top of the page, and it's throwing himself off. Okay, so now that I'm on the right page, we're talking about the gifts of healing. And when we come to the gifts of the Spirit, What's the generic, I hate to call it a generic verse, but what does 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 state? The manifestation is given to every man to profit with all. And we know that the Spirit gives to every man severally as he will. When we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit in order to have or the, any of the gifts of the Spirit in your life, first you have to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Not every gift is for every believer, but the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence is for every believer and for everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So some people might have one gift and another person may have another gift. But he gives to every man severally as he wills. When we look at the gifts of healing, we notice that the word gifts is plural is not singular. When we look at all the other gifts of the Spirit, they're singular. The gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, the gift of interpretation. But then we come to the gifts of healings. Why would it be in a plural form instead of a singular form? 
Because there are all kinds of different ways that people might need to heal. There are all different kinds of forms of sickness. Some sicknesses are um, contagious. Some are not. Some are completely apparent. Maybe if it comes in here with pink eye, you know they have pink eye. There's no denying. Whereas somebody might have a mental illness. Maybe they're suffering from depression. Maybe anxiety. You know, those things don't get healed the same way. They're different forms of sickness. <clears throat> Therefore, there are gifts of healing because not every sickness, not every disease is exactly the same. What about the person who's missing a hand or a foot? That's not the same as a person who has your common cold or the flu. So there are different forms of healing because there are different sicknesses. And when we look at healing and oh, miracles, healings and miracles, sorry, I had it right in front of me and it slipped my mind. Healings and miracles, there are two different things because today we're going to talk a little bit at some point probably about the working of miracles. When we look at the gift of healing, it comes down to a cure. And that's what it is. You have a common cold. It's a cure. You have cancer, the gifts of healing is a cure. If we're talking about the work of miracles, we're talking about power, the demonstration of God's power. So some healings can be miracles, but no miracle is going to be healing because no miracle needs a cure. It needs power, it needs a demonstration, it needs something more. It needs something that only God can do. Now when it comes to sickness, there are lots of sickness in this world today. Why do people get sick? Why do you think that people get sick? What might be at least one reason why somebody might get sick? What's that? Yes, because somebody has a cold and they're not covering their mouth and they sneezed into your mouth and then you get sick. So because it's spread, because I know the face expression, but it happens. You do a little ones, you're telling me that you're not there playing and all of a sudden they sneeze in your mouth. I know it's gross, but it happens. So we get sickness because somebody else had it in the first place. So it gets passed on. What might be some other reasons that we get sick? Because we're human. Because we're human. And if we go a little bit farther, it's not just a matter of our humanity that makes us sick. It goes all the way back to the garden when Adam and Eve disobeyed. So because the sin curse that was placed on our body by God, I'm not even going to question what was going on. But the reality of it, the reason we get sick in the first place is because sin entered into the world. Because of man's disobedience. And because God placed that curse on our bodies, well now we get sickness, we get disease, and when you look at all the years that man's been on the earth, over 6,000, they may be mutated, multiplied. I mean, it's, I hate to say it's humanity, but it's a result of the curse that happened when we get into the day of the garden. And what may be some other reasons? Unbelief. Oh, God, we could get prayed for, and because of our unbelief, we don't get healed. But what might be some other reasons as well? The big one that people don't even think about is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30. 1 Corinthians 11 and 30. If someone has that, I can go ahead and For this cause, many are among you are sick and many sleep. Does verse 
Um, 29 state what we're talking about there, Mom. Are you that eateth and drinketh unworthily, even to drink the damnation of himself, not discerning the Lord's body? So, he that eateth and drinketh unto damnation um, bringeth a cursing unto himself. Those that drink and eat unworthily. What are we talking about here in this passage? What is Paul talking about? Something we might do around Easter time. We're talking about communion. So those that come and take communion, when we break the take the, the crack wafer and uh, say this is the Lord's body that was broken for us, and we do it and remember what was done, and we partake of the cup of grape juice to remember His blood that was shed. We're talking about communion here. There are many people that aren't living right. And that's what Paul was talking about even during his time. The reason that some people are sick among you and are even dead at this point when he refers to those that are asleep is because they had sin in their life and they took communion unworthy. They were not a child of God, but yet they made it look so on the outside and they came for took and they were not worthy to do so. And because of that, they were sick and some even died because of it, because of the judgment of God. Which brings us to the other reason. When we look at sickness, in a, even in church anymore, there's a lot of sickness in this house of God. There really is. And another reason that some people are sick, or there's so much sickness, is because of disobedience. You know, the Bible states, and I don't have it in it, that healing is the children's bread. Which basically, if we are our child, God, healing is for us. But it comes down to that if we are living right. We talked about the formula for healing last, I guess I'm going to heal last week, it was two weeks ago. But the, the formula for healing was um, we need to turn back to God. And then he will tool, um, heal what he had torn. If people are living right, part of the judgment of God is sickness. Because if we go to the book of Ezekiel, the very one of the things that God does when it comes to his house and judgment, or even judgment in general, is he begins at his house. He starts marking those that are his. Some of the people that are sitting in this world are simply because they are a child of God and they're doing whatever they want. And because of that, they are bringing the judgment of God upon them because they're making themselves look good in church. They look like a good upstanding Christian. But yet the moment that they get outside of the church doors, or maybe in private where no one can see them, they are doing everything that is contrary to the Word of God. And because of that, they are bringing the judgment of God upon themselves. Some of the other things that may cause sickness is overeating. We talked about this two weeks ago. We can go to a buffet, and I've even been there and done that. We go to a buffet, it's all you can eat. Well, you want to get your money's worth, so you eat, and you eat, and you eat. And what happens is we push ourselves to the limit, and because of that, we make ourselves sick. So sometimes when we are sick, we bring it upon ourselves. Whether it's eating things that we know we shouldn't eat, whether it's overeating, eating past what we know our body can handle, maybe drinking things. Oh, I know for myself, if I get too much of a sugar intake, I believe that's what it is. Um, I'll feel it affecting my body and it'll affect me one way or the other and you don't want to know which way it's going to affect me one way or the other but that's something that I know so I need to keep a watch on I need to be diligent about it when it comes to our own body sometimes we just eat and drink the wrong stuff we know that this does not agree with our body you know if you have a stomach cancer um, also you don't go out and eat every slice of pizza you know you can handle because of Gas and the spaghetti sauce. And if you get sick in that process, well, guess whose fault it is? It's your own dumb fault. You know that this makes you sick. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can make us sick. And it's not just eating, it's not just drinking. But maybe we are staring at the computer screen too long. Maybe we're reading and our eyes start getting tired and they're aching. Or Maybe we try to keep up with the younger kids when we know that we're not really in the shape right now to do so, and we feel the repercussions later in the day. Or, I mean, these are all things that we bring upon ourselves. 
and these are all things that may need healed. Because the other thing too is, perhaps we owe break, and we are sick in our stomach like we are going to die and it feels that way. And we pray and God actually heals us, miraculously. That does not give us the liberty to go out tomorrow and overeat again and then pray, God, heal me again. We know what it did in the first place. But there are all kinds of ways that our body can get sick. There are those that in their younger years, maybe, they drink. And when I say drink, they drink alcohol and they were alcoholic and they overdid it. They pretty much destroyed their liver. And now they're maybe in their middle age, up there in years, and they're dying because of alcohol cancer. And now they turn their life over to God. Couldn't God heal them? God could do a miracle. But if he doesn't, you know, that's repercussions from earlier in their life. That's something that they did to their own body. God could heal them if he wanted to, but sometimes it's not always God's will either. But that destroyed liver was a repercussion of something that they did. They made themselves sick. So we can do all kinds of stuff to make our bodies sick. And therefore, there are all different kinds of diseases that need to be healed. Does anybody else have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add to that? So moving on to the working of miracles. Well, the working of miracles is one of the power gifts. And when we start breaking down the word in the miracles and looking at it in the Greek words, we see that the word in there is energema. And when we look at it, it literally means an effect, operation, or working. And then when we look at the Greek word for miracles, it is dunamis, force, miraculous power, usually by implication, a miracle itself, ability, abundance, meaning, might, power, strength, violence. So when we look at, well, just going back, we were just talking about healings. Healing deals with curing. The gifts of miracle deals with curing something. The working of miracles deal with power. A demonstration of God's power. It is a supernatural intervention of God. It is something that cannot be done by you. It is something that cannot be done by me. It is that headache that no matter what it you, no Tylenol, no Advil could touch. It is that pain that even Vicodin cannot do away with. It is something that no matter how hard man tries, we can't touch it. Only God can perform the action. And that is what the work of the miracle is. It is something that is impossible for man, but only possible by God. It is His supernatural intervention. And it's something that man cannot even duplicate. It is something that God alone, that God stands alone in that category. If He heals somebody miraculously with the working of miracles, it is a healing touch that man could have never duplicated never duplicate it, no matter what he tried. He might have made it look that way, but he never did. But he never could. It relies upon sheer power, the power of God, and not compassion. When we look at the work, the gifts of America, and we look at the life of Christ, almost every went back to healing, healing, healing. When we look at healings and the gifts of healing, every time we look and see Christ performing a uh, healing act throughout the Word of God, there's something that stands out in the passage probably nine times out of ten. And that is, and he was moved with compassion. When we look at the gifts of healing, a lot of times they are connected with empathy and compassion. When we look at the gift of the gift of the working of miracles, it doesn't rely upon compassion. It doesn't rely upon empathy. It, it 
relies sheerly upon the power of God. Sometimes the working of miracles can be related to some healings, but not all of them. And we've already talked about that healings appear to rely upon compassion and empathy, whereas the working of miracles is reliance upon power. When we look throughout our own lives, even, we can look at miracles in our own life. You realize that the gift of salvation itself is a miracle? There is nothing that a single man on this earth, past, present, or future, and when I say man, I'm not talking about the God man, Jesus Christ. I'm talking about man like you and I, born of Adam, could have ever done. No one could have ever paid the price that Christ paid for salvation. Because we were all born into sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Salvation in itself is a miracle. In the Old Testament, it is a reference where God takes out our old stony heart and replaces it with a heart of flesh. No man could do that. Only God. When we look at the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence is a miracle. Man may try to duplicate it. Man may try to have classes on teaching people how to speak in tongues, Brother Eli. They might tell you to say, I want a Honda, and now say it faster, faster, faster. So it's like, I bought a Honda, bought a Honda, bought a Honda. But that is not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They may try and duplicate it. He may try and duplicate the word of knowledge. But there is no duplicating the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence in other tongues because it only comes from one source, and it is humanly impossible to absolutely duplicate. It is a miracle in itself. So when we look at the working of miracles, why would we need the working of miracles? What is the purpose of the working of miracles? What do you think the purpose, or one of the purposes, of the working of miracles is? Because to bring glory to God. When we look at throughout the Word of God, practically everything in there is to bring glory to God. What did John, Jesus pray in John chapter 17? That the Father may be glorified and magnified. When it comes to our own Christian walk with Christ, is that not what it's about? Magnifying the glory of God? Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? We are to be ambassadors. So what are we doing? We are pointing people. We are pointing praise. We are pointing glory to God. So the purpose of the working miracles is to bring glory to God. To prove that he is the one true God. To prove that he is supreme. And when we look throughout the word of God, there are plenty of examples where God performed a miracle to prove that he was the one true God. We can go all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 5, I believe it is. In the temple of Dagon, the Philistines take the ark of God and they try to worship him with all their other gods. But God knocked down the statue of Dagon, or we would refer to him as Poseidon. And he did it several times. The man knocked it down? Absolutely. But when you look at the whole situation that went on, because they tried to worship him, he cut Dagon in half, he cut off his hands, he cut off his head, um, he inflicted the Philistines with sickness. He performed so much there that they shut down the whole town and the whole temple. That was a miracle of God. And we go to Daniel chapter 5. There's the handwriting on the wall. That in itself was a miracle. It astonished them. It baffled them. No one could have ever duplicated that. But yet God was showing that he was supreme. And he was sending a warning message. And because of that, oh, and in that message he told the king exactly what was going on. He said that he had been waiting the balance. He was going to be found wanting. Tonight, your kingdom is going to be taken away. We 
We can go to the fact of the three Hebrew boys. They were tossed into the fiery furnace. And God performed a miracle. And not only did He perform a miracle with them, but He walked in their midst, showing them the Babylonians that God was supreme and that there's none like Him. And when old Nebuchadnezzar looked in, he said, I don't see three, but I see four. And one like unto the Son of Man. What was the miracle that was performed there? It wasn't just the fact that three Hebrew boys were alive. Because old Nebi lost two of his old men when they were trying to toss them all in. But when they came out, they started sniffing them. And they didn't even smell like smoke. God was showing them that he was supreme. That he was the supreme God. There's at least two times throughout the book of Daniel where God performed miracles. And Nebuchadnezzar recognized that God was the king of heaven, that he was supreme. But he only ever did it with his mouth. But why does God perform miracles? To show that he is the one living God. He is the one true God. And that he is supreme and that there's none like him. We can go to the plagues of Egypt. And there God performed miracle after miracle after miracle. Making fun of their gods and humiliating them. And while the sorcerers might be able to duplicate some of them, they could never do it to the full effect. Full effect. And then it came to a point where God just started making fun of them and making mockery out of them, where he took the actual dust of the sand and turned that to light. There's no way that any of the magicians could have ever done that. They might have changed their um, staffs into serpents in the presence of Pharaoh like Moses did, but even in that situation, God proved himself as being the one true living God, and Moses' rod ate up all the other rods. <clears throat> Maybe some other reason that God might perform a miracle is to inspire faith and show us that, hey, he still has everything under control. There's no reason that we have to worry about this or we have to worry about that. Maybe to provide for special needs. When we look throughout the Word of God, there are different times when God performed miracles to provide for special needs. Can you think of any miracles where God might have performed a special need?
So they wanted Jesus and his disciples to pay tribute. They didn't have it on them, obviously. So what did Jesus tell Peter to do? Go get a fish out of the water, and there will be a coin or the money in his mouth. That in itself is a miracle. Because how many people went fishing in here, and how many people have ever found money in a fish's mouth? Probably nobody. But Jesus performed a miracle for a particular situation. Sometimes God performs miracles um, on our behalf for our own protection. I'm reminded of a book I read in years and years and years ago where there were these missionaries and they were ministering to this tribe. And there was another tribe that came to kill off the entire tribe. And that night when they came to kill off everybody in that tribe, the missionaries were in their hut praying. Days, weeks, years, I don't know how much time passes. I don't remember. It's been a very long time since I read the account. But they were able to sit down with these people that came against and killed everyone in that tribe but them that night. And they said, you killed all these people. Why didn't you kill us? They said, well, we tried, but your, your hut was surrounded by soldiers on horseback. They said every time that one of our men got close to the house, one of those soldiers on horseback would come out and charge at us. What is that? That was a miracle. That was the protection of God. Years ago, Smith Wigglesworth told an Indo a man who had stump legs to go to the shoe shop and buy shoes. That man with his stump legs goes into that shoe shop, tells the guy to get him a pair of shoes, tells him what size. He brings out the shoes. The guy still has stump legs. As he's putting on the first shoe, all of a sudden that foot miraculously grows. When he puts on the second shoe, the same thing happened. What was that? That was a miracle of God for a particular situation. That man needed a healing touch. He needed a miracle. Sometimes God does miracles to open up doors for us to talk to other people about him and point them to him that they may receive Christ. In your notes, you will notice it to be to open the door to evangelism because that's what we call it. When we reach out to somebody to tell them about Christ that they may have a relationship with him, refer to as evangelism. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are going about their everyday routine. What do I mean by that? They would go to the river to pray. And every day, they were confronted by this little girl that would make fun of them. After reading it in uh, the Word of God, it would say that she comes and say that these are the men of the Most High God. It might seem common, but when you say that, she was making fun of them. She was talking to them. And because of that, Paul finally got tired of it, and he cast out the demon. Well, there goes that person's money, and they get angry, and they take it before the magistrates, and they want Paul and Silas reprimanded because they just lost their income. They're all kinds of upset and angry. And because of this, Paul and Silas get sent to prison. And when the jailer gets told of their crime, he wants to make sure that these men don't get out. So he places them, as the Bible says, in the innermost part of the jail. If we study it out, the innermost part of the jail, when it refers to that in the Bible, that's the dungeon. He wanted to make sure that they weren't going anywhere. And he binds their hands and their feet to make sure that, because he, brother Eli, if these men escape their punishment, that falls on me. These men, they're not going anywhere. I don't want to deal with it. But at midnight, despite the circumstance, Paul and Silas are praising God, singing praises, and what happens? God performs a miracle. The earth shakes. Well, maybe it was just an earthquake. Maybe it was just a volcano going off in Hawaii. But then the bones are loose. Their hands are free. Their feet are free. Where they were once lined up, all the doors are wide open. But this gives them an opportunity to minister to that jailer and point them to Christ. And because of everything that Paul and Silas went through, 
God performed a miracle and gave them an opportunity to reach that jailer for him. And as a result, that jailer got saved and that jailer's entire family got saved. So sometimes God performs a miracle that other people might receive him as their personal savior. To bear witness of the gospel. You know that the word of God is true. It is in error. It is not fallible in any way. It is 100% true. Regardless of how many times people try to prove it wrong. Regardless of what people say. And God will perform a miracle if he has to, to prove that his word is true. We're not going to read it for the sake of time because I am fastly running out of time. Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 12. 12, we find that there is a false prophet by the name of our Jesus running around. And he's coming against Paul. And what happens? A mist comes upon him and he receives blindness for a set amount of time. Or for a particular amount of time. What was that? That was a working of miracles by God. And when we see, read this account here, we'll find that because of this incident here, that there were many there that turned to Christ. To give credibility to the man or woman of God, to give credit to the minister, if we thought, would read in 2 Kings chapter 2, 23-25, and we're not going to turn to any passage because right now I am basically out of time, we find that there were a bunch of kids that come out. And apparently the man of God was kind of like me right now. He was bald. And they come out and they're making fun of him. Go up, bald head. Go up, thou bald head. When we're looking at this passage, our minds goes to, well, they're making fun of his physical appearance. They weren't making fun of his physical appearance. They were making fun of his religion and saying that his religion is vain and that his head is empty. There's nothing up there. That God doesn't exist and that his religion is false. That's what these young kids were saying. And God performs a miracle. And two she-bears come out and they eat up all these kids. You have Elijah on Mount Carmel coming against the prophets of Baal. And all day the prophets of Baal are trying to get a hold of their God. And they're cutting themselves. And they're crying out. And old Elijah, in my mind's eye, it's a little wacky, I realize. You don't want to get stuck in my mind because you might not ever get out. It's a scary place. But I can almost see you. Elijah up there around Carmel, possibly, and his lazy boy up there, maybe a sweet tea in one hand, and all day watching this, and making fun of him. And he's taunting them as they're crying out from time to time, and he's saying, well, maybe your God doesn't hear you because he's taking a long journey. And then it gets to a point that he says, well, maybe your God can't hear you because he's on the tour there and he's going to the bath. Literally, that is the translation of one of the taunts. And then finally we get to the point where Elijah says, okay, enough is enough. And he steps up and tells him, prepare the sacrifice. Dig a moat. Dig a trench. Fill it with water. And then dump water on top of the sacrifice. And then to give credibility to the man and woman of God and to prove that he is God supreme, God performs a miracle. And he sends down fire. And the fire doesn't just consume the sacrifice. But it consumes all the water. And it consumes the dust. And leaves a burnt ring literally on the ground. That no man could deny. And then finally, we, God performs, we have the working of miracles. And God performs miracles <coughs> simply that we may do his will. And to do his work. This one we will read just in closing. Mark 16, 20. Mark 16, 20, if you have that. And I'll, I'll make one more reference yet here. We just won't read it. But look at this Mark 16, 20. 
20 or 80. So they did the work of the Lord with signs following. You know, if we are doing God's work, God will perform miracles on our behalf. It always doesn't come just willy-nilly, but they do come with a price. But we cannot limit the God, limit our God to performing the miracles that He does, because God's ways are not our ways, and His mind is not our our mind. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In Acts chapter 8, 39 and 40, we find that Philip, after he baptized the Ethiopian unit, for whatever reason, God needed him that quickly, eight miles away, that he miraculously transports him like that from one place to another. But all these things come with a cost. And the cost is living in obedience to God on a daily basis. Pray, fast. And I am shutting up because I am way out of time. Anybody have any thoughts, questions, anything they want to add at this point? If not, we'll bow our heads and prepare our hearts for sin. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high and that there's no one like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels down the four corners of the property above and below. That no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and minds will be in one mindset and one accord. That we may worship you in sincerity and truth, Lord. That the Holy Ghost may have his way as he so desires. And with the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the strict instruments and the vocal cords, give them a special blessing. And with the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today, give him a special blessing as well. May our hearts and our minds be prepared that they be good soil for your word to fall on. That we may remember throughout the week even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus.